Hello and welcome to the Focusing Way podcast. I'm your host, David Battistella. Today on the Focusing Way podcast, our guest is Barbara Dickinson. Barbara Dickinson finished a long career at the United States Federal Reserve in 2010 and now consults on strategic organizational improvement. She has earned, among other credentials, certification as a strengths performance coach from the Gallup organization. In 2006, she learned the practice called focusing, completing her certification as a focusing professional in 2009 and is now an enthusiastic learner and teacher of the many facets of focusing and the related practice, thinking at the edge. After volunteering her services to the Focusing Institute as a management consultant in 2011 and 2012, Barbara decided to share her expertise more widely as a strengths-oriented consultant interested in helping individuals and nonprofit organizations innovate, think, and work at their edge, improve emotional intelligence, and build better teams. She's especially interested in applying this interactive focusing method to help people form healthier relationships at all levels. Barbara lives in New Jersey with Holly, her Jack Russell Terrier. Modeling that conversation um including whatever pauses might have uh been occurring of what that sounded like where and and maybe in the form of like i would say this sentence this would happen i would listen to this sentence i would then like in that sort of step-by-step slow motion version of what that kind of conflict resolution uh, how you experienced it. Okay. I'm going to take a, a moment, a short one, and think about the content because, interestingly, if I'm not careful about the content, I might reveal the identity of... I was thinking about the identity of the original person, which I'd like to keep confidential, but then I was thinking about, well, I could use a recent conflict I've had with a family member, but then I thought, no, that would be identifiable too. <laughs> so I, have, I may have to make up a conflict, but I can, I can do it. Um, one of the things to say about how we designed this was you got to say your sentence. Your sentence could not be a paragraph. You had to be fair. It had to be a, you know, a reasonable length sentence. The listener reflected not the sentence word for word, but what they heard was the gist of the sentence. And especially if there was a clear emotional quality. And and both of us were focusers, so focusing language was used. Mm-hmm. And then the focuser who had just said the sentence and heard it reflected just had a chance to take it in See if it was right, and if it wasn't quite right, add a word or two that would adjust it until it felt just right, and could ask to have that word or two reflected, but that was it. You only got one chance there, and the reason was there was so much anger in this that there was a real danger that one or the other of us was going to just you know, blow up and start reeling off insults, and we were trying to prevent that. And then it was the next one's turn. The listener then became the focuser. They got their sentence. They got their reflection. They got their check-in adjustment if necessary, and then switched turns again. So if I was in conflict with someone over speaking to me in a way that I thought was rude, Mm -hmm. I might start off the exchange by saying, You said that I was treating you disrespectfully and you didn't take into account 
the fact that you had just been disrespectful to me five minutes before. That's my sentence. Then my listener would say, something in you seems angry because you heard me say you were being disrespectful, but you believe that I had been disrespectful to you just before. And I hear that. And I think, yeah, that's accurate. That feels right inside. So I say, okay, I'm not going to do an adjustment in this case. Then the second person says, when you say I've been disrespectful of you, I get really angry because you interrupt me all the time and you don't seem to notice how disrespectful that is. Now I'm the listener and I say to the person, something in you is really angry when you hear me say you've been disrespectful because you're noticing that I interrupt from your perspective all the time and don't seem to notice it. Have I got that right? <laughs> mm -hmm. And that person hears that, takes it in and says, well, it feels almost right, but when you said that I'm noticing that you interrupt, something in me jumps up and says, I want you to admit that. And that's a crucial moment because I could, at that moment, take that right back into just an argument, a standard conflict back and forth. And I have to be able to hear what that person said and simply reflect. You want to adjust it to say that you have something in you that would like me to admit that or mm -hmm. wants me to. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much what we did. And what I noticed happening in the course of many weeks of this, by the way, this went on for a long time because the conflict was deep and broad. Mm -hmm was how much we learned about each other's background to the conflict that had erupted between us. There were things I didn't know about him and there were things he didn't know about me and we learned a lot that came out in those sentences. But at no point did we have to listen to 15 or 20 or 30 minutes of a litany of our defects, which is what happens in many conflicts especially where one or the other of the parties is the more powerful person, louder, bigger, stronger, violent, who knows. Mm -hmm. But this levels the playing field. Yeah. I'm just noticing how effective that strategy uh, because it just brings into my thinking the, the the notion that slowing down is the fastest way there and the idea that taking uh, you know and it even sort of brings me down to some of my acting experience where sometimes we would take scenes that were explosive into a whisper in order to sort of rediscover um, the thing, the words and how those words were affecting and uh, letting the words affect and, and then, you know, letting the next, the, the next line. Now, of course, in acting, you're restricted by, you know, what's been written, but that doesn't mean you can't experience each moment and each thought freshly and that, that, make your voice and your body respond in a way that can change the direction of something. So sometimes where you would want to yell, you might whisper. You might come back with just a whisper. And and that would change the dynamic and the and in what you're describing is that also you're describing people 
two people who are extremely committed to finding a solution and willing to try uh, a, a, or and agree on a kind of process that might work because it will resolve something. That's very true. I was almost getting nostalgic there for a minute, thinking about how we came to be in that situation and how it worked out. And at the same time, I want to go back to what you were saying about your acting experience and the notion of whispering. And I, I laughed a little bit inside of me, thinking about the next time I got into an argument with a volatile person, what would happen if I suddenly started to whisper what it was I wanted to say? It's that that uh, process that happens when you change your behavior, the other person kind of has to change, which is what we're talking about when we talk about living forward. And it also raised for me the other piece of research I've seen. I'd have to go look up where it comes from, but it divides up the impact that we have on another person into our body language, our tone of voice, or it may be facial expressions and body language, but the, but the visual, the content, and the tone of voice. So what we're saying, the volume, tone of voice, how we say it, and what our body's doing when we say it. And the surprising thing about that research is that content and tone of voice, I think, are the lesser impact and what you're body language is, is the greater impact. There's a wonderful TV commercial where the mother and the daughter are yelling at each other at the top of their lungs. Their body language is angry. Their tone is angry. The first time that I heard that commercial, I was stunned because of how much I had assumed based on looking at them and hearing their tone and volume and the way my brain caught up with the content that they were actually saying something so very different. But I'd already written a whole story about what kind of an interaction this was between a mother and a daughter. And so I'm going to take in what you were talking about with whispering and tone and continue to develop this idea about focusing as a tool for conflict resolution. I think there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of need for it. And I know that, for example, the work that's been done in Afghanistan, that's exactly what they're doing, just getting people to pause. And in South America, teaching the revolutionary pause, just that piece of what we do in focusing can help to bring about a different end to a situation that could erupt even in not just conflict, but violence. I think there's really fertile ground for us focusers, and especially us interactive focusers, mm -hmm. to, to teach this method and to take everything into account that you and I have talked about today and more to help to develop it and help to spread it. Yeah. Yeah, and as you were, as you were saying that, what really sort of hit home is that the, the reflecting part of uh, companioning and letting somebody know that you you get you get a turn, but you've got to listen to somebody in a way that's going to allow you to mirror or reflect back what they've just said to you, and it forces a kind of heightened awareness and turns something on in the in the brain in the memory to experience that other person and listen to them deeply in a way enough to be able to to tell them almost you know in a in an immediate kind of way feedback exactly what what you've heard and then to have the opportunity what, to understand whether your listening has been accurate i mean to me just those those steps alone create a kind of new situation for conflict resolution 
just in in the sense that it's a forced kind of listening. And in in the situation you described, um, exchanging one sentence at a time was, you know, a way to experience the person, experience what was how you were being triggered by that person, experience how things you were saying was triggering that person, and in that whole dynamic between two people, maintain a kind of uh, openness, maintain a kind of openness to how that whole experience can change you. Mm. You made a really important point. Well, you made several really important points, but the one that I want to go back to was the one about the desire to resolve the conflict. And as I was just listening to what you were saying at the end here, I thought, yeah, if the two people involved don't want to resolve the conflict, if they are so badly locked into their point of view that they can't come out and seek resolution, I'm wondering, is there anything that could happen, that could change that. It occurred to me that two people that are so badly locked inside themselves that they would refuse to try to resolve a conflict might still be moved. Something in them might stir if they saw this process happening. I've had that experience of not being resistant, but being in the presence of two people just doing an interactive focusing session and seeing the impact it has on them. I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that I had seen this and and experienced this both with people I know and with total strangers. And it's even more stunning to me that when I step into an interactive focusing session with someone I just met in the workshop we can still have an incredibly meaningful exchange, even though we barely know each other. Um, mm-hmm. Just for those few minutes of that of that time. Just by bringing those qualities. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Or that state of being, if for another term, the qualities of focusing partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm just looking at our time, and I, I hope I'm not infringing on the time we've taken in, in your day. But I mean, this conversation for me has been so uh, rich and so um, meaningful uh, that I'm even just wanting to take a moment just to honor and um, just really want to take a pause and really just a real pause of gratitude um, for for how um, much you've shared and and the effect that's had on me. I bow in gratitude to you for inviting me into this conversation. I have enjoyed it even more than I thought I would. And I don't think there's much more important to me in the world than sharing this work because it has such tremendous potential and because it has been so beneficial to me so far. Mm. So thank you. Gratitude right back at you. Yeah, I can honestly say I totally share that sentiment of sharing the work. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you one more question. And it's, um, it's, it's about how it's something that the kind of focusers you and I are, which is, which is we are we represent people who've come to focusing not from a world of therapy, um, but from sort of a diverse background, from sort of traditional therapy. How would you how would you invite somebody into focusing if they're not currently a therapist? Well, I guess, David, what you've just discovered is my other favorite topic, which is focusing for the rest of us. Besides therapy, there's a lot of people in the focusing world who are very 
interested in and deeply involved with Eugene Genlin's philosophy. Many of these people are professional philosophers, and I'm not one of those either. Full disclosure, I mentioned I did find focus, find out about focusing through a therapist, but I quickly came to a place of wanting to apply it in the business world where I worked, uh, where I guess I still work. Um, I'm in a, a different professional venue now, but there's a real need for support for those of us that use focusing outside of the world of psychotherapy and who aren't in the world of academic or professional philosophy. And what I have found, I alluded to it a little bit earlier on, that it's possible to bring focusing skills into all kinds of conversations and situations, and I think that's what I've done the most. So in business, I did actually teach some people in business how to do focusing as an experiment, and we agreed that it was a wonderful skill, but it was risky in the workplace because it left us feeling open and vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And that didn't, in our particular work environment, that didn't feel safe at all. But in the past couple of years, I've also done some consulting where it was known that I was a practitioner of focusing. The people I worked with, one of them is a focuser, the other two are not. They did not have to learn it to use it. They were people who had an understanding of mindfulness, but they didn't have the specific skills. And I used it to help them develop a vision and a mission and a strategy and an implementation to create a new nonprofit organization. Wow. And it, it worked. <laughs> so I'm a big supporter of focusing for the rest of us. How do we do it? How do we support it? Where can we apply it? One of the things that I was very fortunate to be able to work on with Eugene Genlin was the ideas that he had for moving, focusing out into the larger world through professional organizations. Mm -hmm. For example, could we make contact with the National Association of School Superintendents and teach them what a wonderful thing focusing is and inspire and encourage them to bring it to their schools, to their teachers and their students and their staffs? Mm -hmm. Because if you believe, as I do, that focusing is the essential skill to emotional literacy. And if you believe, as I do, at least here in the United States, that emotional literacy is something we badly need in our education, mm -hmm. how hard is it to implement a focusing curriculum that the children can learn and grow up to be emotionally more literate? Well, let's just say than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. how does that do at answering your question yeah it just it, it helps me imagine the kind of world we can create through this work and the importance of having these conversations and not just one on one but sharing this exchange with people so that they can they can be possibly stimulated or awakened or um, inspired. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Let's keep it up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think the times I've thought about focusing in the business world, that if it was um, from the point of view of because focusing can also be narrowed down it is actually focusing and i think about focusing a camera lens and when i do that when i'm you know i'm a filmmaker and a cinematographer and there are times where i put a point of focus on a frame 
and that thing is in focus and other things are not. And when I think about the word focusing and focusing in those terms, then, uh, you know, in a business context, it, it, it could be more pinpointing the focus on things like decision making. Like, wouldn't you as a CEO or as a board or as a... Um, uh, wouldn't you want to be making these decisions from a, a place that feels really right and not just and and that is even after considering all of the all of the things uh, but just sort of taking things in a direction from a from a sense of rightness and not um, always from a sense of uh, bottom lines and I think it's something you know uh, business leaders are faced with constantly it's a kind of a, an inner conflict you probably have encountered many people who you know have faced a kind of a, an inner conflict with a decision point uh, that you know might have an effect on on their stress level or something um, so I've always thought about narrowing it to um, you know making it Making it sort of appropriate to the situation, uh, and then and then also understanding that that process can be deepened and go as deep as it needs to. Uh, but I think if it's taught as something that oh, this is really deep, and you know this is where you're going to get inside, and you're going to you know resolve like uh, you're going to you're going to resolve so many things that it, that it, I think that's where it becomes uh, unsafe, or people start to say, "Why." Well, you know, in the business world might say, no, wait, I, I need, you know, practical tools that will, um, you know, assist in creating a better workplace, let's say. So, or making a better decision uh, or taking this in a direction that feels kind of right, but I haven't been able to sort of pinpoint the exact sort of things that have to happen to do that. Then I think that is where focusing can really help in the business world. I like what you're saying a lot because besides decision making, the other thing I'm noticing that is a struggle for so many people in the working world is something that we call time management. As one of my friends likes to say, you cannot manage time. But what they're really talking about is an ability to prioritize that goes beyond what's on the surface. So imagine the person that's got 15 projects today and every single one of them is top urgency and top importance and something has to be done. And they look at it and they say, well, there's no way I can do it. I don't have enough hours in a day for this. But if we drill just a little bit deeper and use our focusing skills to get a sense of something like the truth in the data, we can start to sift through those urgencies and those importance factors and come up with a different priority list that says, oh, well, there are 15 projects, but I really only have to get something done on five of them today. Mm -hmm. That makes my day more manageable. That makes me less stressed than I was, brings my blood pressure down, allows me to maybe take a break for lunch and think of something healthy to eat instead of junk food and be better able to communicate with the people around me about what else needs to be done. And that is a very real skill. As I watch people burn themselves out for the lack of that skill, I think, Let's get focusing skills in at that level. Mm. Your idea to get them in the C-suites, the executives being able to make decisions that they're more comfortable and confident with, well, that goes to all levels too. Absolutely. Yeah, especially middle management. Um, yeah. I know when I was in that at that level, I wanted to be able to read the minds of the people above me and below me. But what we're really talking about is intuition, and I think that focusing is a an extraordinarily effective way to improve through practice and training our intuition. Mm -hmm. Cultivating that intuition, really, mm -hmm. really um, inviting it. Even I like is is a word I like. 
because I think people tend to possibly believe they can't bring that because that environment uh, from you know some from a young age isn't perceived as a place to uh, unless you're in a creative industry maybe um, but very often these can be you know environments where that kind of thing is not encouraged uh, it's not in the culture um, so you know I think you even have to sort of consider bringing a culture of focusing to the environment and then um, you know see what kind of effect that can have mm. Mm. let's work on that yeah I like that <laughs> okay well I want to really thank you very much for your time today. And uh, I really feel like we could probably do this again soon because there are a few more questions on my list that I didn't get to. Um, but I, I do want to take the time to fully appreciate everything uh, you've shared and to wholeheartedly thank you for taking the time to share with me today. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, David. Thank you for the opportunity. Stay tuned for part two of our podcast with Barbara Dickinson and our focusing-oriented conversation about interactive focusing. You've been listening to The Focusing Way podcast, available on iTunes and Stitcher. I'm your host, David Battistella. Please visit our website at thefocusingway.com.